Not sure we're going to make it tonight all the way through, but we're going to give it a shot. Miracles and Money, Part 6. We've been studying the apostates and the way in which they try to use this passage in Acts chapter 28 to say that they're doing these miracles and so everybody should give lots of money to them. Acts 28, beginning in verse 6. Paul has just been shipwrecked on the island. He's been putting logs on the fire. A snake has come out and bit him. And so they think that he must be either a god or a murderer. Started with a murderer and then ended up thinking he was a god. Howbeit, when they looked while he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they'd looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. Gracious Heavenly Father, again we pray for your blessings on your word as we study it tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Money and Miracles, Part 6. Now, I'm going to give you again the basic premise that we're starting with this study. The key to riches is this. Who remembers the premise? It's not what you own, but how you view what you own. Okay, that's our premise. Because the rich guy can be covetous, the poor guy can be covetous. Or the rich man may not be covetous, and the poor guy can be covetous. So it's not what you own, it's how you view what's your own. God doesn't condemn you for being rich because he gave it to you in the first place. We talked about that. It's God that gives us the power to get wealth or withhold wealth from us. And we learned that there were some reasons that God may withhold wealth from us. Number one, to prove us, that is to test where our heart lies. And number two, to do us good at the end if we respond properly to the test of money. And we saw that in the second restatement of the law over in Deuteronomy chapter 8. The warning was about false gods. You remember that passage. And uh, money has certainly become a false god of the day in which we live. So we've learned two things thus far. Having money is a stewardship given by God. Use it wisely or else one of two things can happen. He can take it away or yeah, he can make it so that you can't enjoy it. And we saw that in Ecclesiastes. So summary of principles. The key to biblical wealth management. Do you view yourself as a steward who must give account for all that's given to you? Are you willing to let it go when God takes it? We looked at lots of illustrations in the Bible that told us about people who fail to have the divine perspective on money. We looked at Proverbs chapter 37 through 9. We saw the key to those verses is contentment, and we have to learn how to be content. Most of us are not. We looked at the principal passage where Paul warned Timothy about money and apostates in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We studied the principal passage where Peter warned about money and apostates. That was 2 Peter 2. We saw both Paul and Peter give another reason for preaching apostasy, which is immoral sex, uh, 2 Timothy 3. Peter gave three illustrations that show the character of the apostates. 2 Peter chapter 2, the angels that followed Satan in the fall, lust for power, the world in the days of Noah, rejection of the true God, and Sodom, lust for perverted sex apart from the divine standard of marriage. Jude wrote his entire epistle to show the character of the apostates, and he mentions both their greed and their wicked lust for sex. That's Jude verses 3 through 25. In other words, as we summarized last week, the issue of apostasy, greed, and immoral sex is a huge topic in the Bible. We also tied it into the morning worship services where we saw that covetousness is idolatry, and the covetous man is an idolater, Colossians 3, 5, and Ephesians 5, 5, and God judges and kills idol worshipers among his people. We've seen lots of illustrations of that. Last week, we began a study on the restrictions that God gives when he knows we might focus on one of our sins of character weakness. All of us have a sin of character weakness somewhere. It usually relates to one of the seven different deadly sins. But we have a character weakness that is weak in a particular area. Have you identified where you have a character weakness? It's very wise to do that. Paul did it. And we looked at where Paul identified it last week. We'll talk about that in just a second because I want to pick up at that point. But God often gives us a restriction when he, can, when he knows that we might focus 
on one of our sins of character weakness, like we might love money too much. But you know, it could be any sin. If we have a character weakness, it could be any sin. Paul had a character weakness, which he admitted. What was that character weakness? Does anybody remember? Being the center of attention. Yeah, pride. Mm -hmm. Paul loved being the center of attention. It's like the guy that stands up at the front and he waves his hand and says, may I have your attention, please? And everybody stops talking. They turn and look at him. He says, thank you. I just love attention. (laughs) Uh, Paul had a weakness in that. He admits it. We need to learn to admit it too. And Paul knew that he might think too much of himself because God was focusing so much of his attention on Paul and giving him so much special revelation. So in Paul's case, Paul called it a thorn in the flesh. Sometimes God gives you and me a thorn in the flesh. That is a point of suffering, the thorn in the flesh. When, when, how many of you have ever had a thorn stuck in you? Yeah, yeah, we all have, haven't we? I can remember one time as a little kid, I was like seven or eight years old, and I was riding my bicycle in Texas. Texas has a lot of what are called prickly pears. If you all know what a prickly pear is? Yeah, 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 sort of a cactus that has these big round leaves and thorns are sticking out every which way. And I was riding down a dirt path between piles of prickly pears. And I didn't want to fall over and I didn't want to ride too fast because I knew if I rode too fast, I'd probably run into one of them. So I'm riding too slow and I hit a rock and I fell over into a prickly pear. You don't just get one thorn from a prickly pear. (laughs) The whole side of my body was covered with thorns. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. I I can empathize with him. I know what that feels like. I think you can too. God gives us that suffering to refine our character and to keep us from sin. Did you know that's the grace of God when God does something like that? Because the results of sin are far more painful than than the thorn that keeps you from the sin. It's an important thing to remember. When God chastens you, Paul talks about it as chastening in other passages, but when he gives you a thorn in the flesh, when he gives you some chastening, it's designed to refine your character, to help you overcome those character weaknesses. It's designed to keep you from further worse sin. Paul understood that. Sometimes Satan himself or a demonic enemy will be used by God to slow your character weakness down so that it doesn't enhance your sin. But in every case, whenever God does that, God always enables us to deal with it in a way that is for our good and his glory. Paul's thorn in the flesh did not incapacitate him. It did not stop him from doing ministry, but it was a constant reminder to focus on ministry and not on the pride that could have developed. God was reminding him. It was like a hole in a little balloon so that the little balloon never got too big. God will enable you to deal with it in a way that's for your good and his glory. So when you find yourself, and Paul was going through some other kinds of thorns, barbarians, freezing cold, Some of you have recently experienced that, out shoveling snow, being snake-bitten. Praise the Lord, I've never been snake-bitten, though I've seen a lot of them down in Texas. Remember that God is refining you. When God does that, he is refining you as pure gold tried in the fire. Job 23.10, but I knoweth the way that I, he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. And that's what Paul is talking about In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, where he says, Unless I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Did you get that? Paul said it twice. Lest I should be exalted above measure. He says it twice in one verse. So we know that Paul honestly understood that special revelations that God could give him could have made him exceedingly proud. I think most of us would fall into that category too. If we had direct communication with God, if he was giving us new revelation, if we could stand up at the front of the church and not have to study the Bible and say, thus saith the Lord, and give new revelation from God, do you think you might get a fat head? Yeah, I think so. I would. I'm glad it didn't happen to me. (laughs) I wouldn't want Paul's thorn in the flesh. God gives me other thorns in the flesh. But he had a messenger of Satan who was beating up on him. 
Now, I think we need to learn to be honest about our own character weaknesses because unless we are honest about ourselves and about our own character weaknesses, we will never have victory over them. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, Lord, or asked the Lord, what character weakness do I have? Is it sloth? Is it one of the devil's best tools, which is discouragement? Do I find myself easily discouraged, ready to give up? You know, that little wedge of discouragement, which leads to despondency and what they call today depression, where you just want to give up, that's one of the devil's best tools, and he uses it against Christians all the time. Is that a character weakness? You know, I was talking to someone today about another person who is always happy. It doesn't matter what kind of bad things happen. They are always happy. They're always filled with joy. You know, their particular character weakness is not in the area of despondency or depression or wanting to give up or feeling sorry for themselves or being sad all the time. That could be your weakness. Your weakness might be lust. Have you identified it? so that you can deal with it. You might get a thorn in the flesh if that's your area of weakness in character. Identify the area of your character weakness and when you do that, then you have a handle on getting victory over it because otherwise God will give you a thorn in the flesh in that specific area. It's better to deal with it than get the thorn in the flesh. I think most of us want to avoid the thorns. Well, anyway, back to the text. So we need to be honest about our character weaknesses to get victory over them. And there may even be a point when God must give a thorn in the flesh to help remind us from time to time. Now, remember the passage you just read here. It was a thorn in the flesh. In other words, it was a physical restriction that related to the body. Why? Why did God have to give him something that related to the body as a physical restriction? Because we express what is going on in our spirit through our bodies. You can't communicate outside of the body. ESP is the demonic kind of stuff. You don't communicate that way. Your body, your expressions, the way in which you carry yourself, your body language, people call it, as well as the things that you say. We have to express ourselves, what is in our spirit, through our bodies. So God gave Paul a thorn in the flesh, that is, something that was in his body, because we express what's going on in our spirits through the use of our body. You know, to restrict your body, God has lots of options. He really does. He has lots of options. I mean, he could do anything all the way from giving you paralysis. We talked about that lady who was in Columbia Presbyterian Hospital who couldn't do anything for herself even though she had millions of dollars. He can, he can do that to you, total paralysis, to throwing you in jail, to restrict you from using your body in a way that would bring shame to him when he has a job that he wants you to get done. Now he's going to guarantee that you will get done what he wants to get done or he will take you home. But along the way, he can restrict your use of your body so that you will be reminded you better do everything for the glory of God, otherwise you're in serious trouble. The Apostle Paul understood that. Now that brings us back full circle to what we had studied a number of weeks ago, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God commands us to treat it properly with moral purity and with care. We don't have to guess what that means. There are specific areas in which you must protect your body temple, and most of them relate to moral purity and not merely physical exercise. And we talked about how our culture is all focused on the physical. The Generation X and the Millennials are all focused on going to the gym and doing all that physical stuff. But, you know, a pagan can get good results by obeying biblical principles, even if they're not saved. And we talked about that as well. Because Paul often uses physical exercise to describe the Christian life. And he obviously is not using evil things to parallel or to describe good spiritual things. For example, know ye not that they which run all run in a race, but one receives the prize. So run that ye may obtain. He's using a physical illustration there of a sport 
of exercise. So sports are not wrong, but sports can become your God. I've known people throughout my life where sports were their God and where their bodies were their God. You think about all the athletes that you have known of, like Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, you know, and how at the end of their life, their body deteriorated. You know, you can't keep your body in perfect physical shape. You should treat it with care and respect because it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. But your body's going to get old. It's going to wrinkle up. It's going to die, even you young ones. Don't focus on the body, although you keep it in good shape and keep it morally pure. Focus on developing the character of Christ, because that's what lasts forever. And sometimes God will affect your body so that you will learn to focus on the inner man instead of on the exterior man, the outer man. Okay, so we saw multiple passages in the New Testament that teach the principle of the body temple, our responsibility for keeping it morally pure and spiritually pure, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6, and we ended last week with Ephesians 2, 19 through 20. Now, we've just read through that passage there in verses 6 through 10 of Acts 28. So in the first message of the series, so we're back now on track, we've just summarized everything from the past. In the first message of the series, I pointed out that the very first thing that struck me as odd is that God decided not to change the minds of the pagans about Paul being a god. God could have chosen not to heal anybody on the island. God could have chosen not to heal the father of Publius, the governor of the island. God could have chosen never to let the people know that Paul had the gift of healings that he didn't have the gift of miracles. God could have just kept Paul from doing anything. God could have kept the snake from ever biting Paul. They would never have known a thing about Paul except he's a diligent little Jewish guy that throws wood on the fire. God let them see something, come to some wrong conclusions, see some additional miracles, and no doubt listen to Paul preach, though his preaching is not mentioned in this passage here in Acts chapter 28. When people thought that Paul was a god before, what happened to him? You remember back in Acts chapter 14? He got stoned. Not like modern people get stoned, but he really got stoned back then. God used Paul's gifts on the island of Melita as a means of providing for Paul and for everybody else. 276 people got taken care of because of Paul. And he didn't change the minds of the people on the island, but he brought them a blessing, didn't he? You know, people can sometimes get a blessing through you as a Christian and not really understand why it came. It often happens. Someday in eternity they'll know. In fact, it may be used against them, as it probably was against some of these people here. But God used that one man to meet the needs of everybody else. Now, We're going to talk tonight. I told you there were two points that I didn't get to cover last week. So we're going to talk about how God always meets the needs of his own children and those around them get a blessing as well. God meets the needs of his own children in various ways. Tonight, in contrast to the apostates who want money for miracles, we want to look at the two ways that God normally meets the needs of his children. These are obviously self-evident, but you should know the references to this so that when you run into charismatic types, you'll be able to say, now look, that's not the way God meets the needs of his children. So the two are, number one, diligent personal work. Duh. Right? That's a duh. Diligent personal work. That's normally the first way that God meets the needs of his children. The second, other Christians, now listen to the next phrase, who have the right perspective on money. Other Christians who have the right perspective on on money. If they have the wrong perspective, they won't be part of this. But other Christians who have the right perspective on money will be one of the methods that God uses to meet the needs of needy Christians. In other words, these are believers who know that they are stewards, going back to that initial premise that we put underneath this whole message, they know that they're stewards and not owners of the personal resources that God has entrusted to them. Now, I want to look at the second method first. Second method, which is other Christians. One of the methods 
God uses to meet the needs of Christians is, now listen to the next word, it's a big word. I don't know if you understand this word. This word has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven letters. That's a big word. Is a big word? Eleven letters? Is that a big word? It's not as big as supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, <laughs> but it's a big word. It begins with an S. This is a special word. How many of you can guess what this word is? It begins with an S. It ends in an L. You thought you could guess, but you didn't, right? <laughs> it's the word sacrificial. Sacrificial. We don't like that word. But one of the methods that God uses to meet the needs of other believers is sacrificial sharing with other believers. You know, the New Testament talks a lot about that. Old Testament does too, but the New Testament especially. Sacrificial sharing with other believers. Most of us don't like the concept of sacrificial sharing, so it's good for us to be reminded of it. This morning we mentioned the widow who gave her two mites. That was sacrificial. Jesus said that she gave more than all the rich of the rich people who were throwing hundreds of shekels into the offering box. Why? Because they gave out of their abundance, but she gave everything that she had. And she was a widow. It wasn't that was what was left over from the weekly allowance that her husband gave her to buy groceries. She was a widow. She gave everything that she had. That principle is not just for the Gospels, but it's squarely in the doctrinal epistles of the New Testament after Pentecost as well. Pentecost has been called the birthday of the church, so this is clearly not Old Testament principle of tithing that we're talking about here. A lot of people in the church today think, oh, all I have to give is the tithe. Oh, I'm doing my job because I am tithing. Uh, and I'm not tithing on my gross. I'm tithing off my net because, after all, these other things are responsibilities that I have, you know, and, and God can always take care of himself. So i got to pay the, uh, the house payment, the mortgage. You know, i got to pay the payment on my car. And, you know, i got to pay for this and i got to pay for that. And i got insurance and, I, you know, all the stuff that everybody has. And then what I have left over, I'll tithe on that. So that, I got to have some spending money too, you know. I got to have some spending money. That's the way most Christians think. Huh. You know, it's not the Old Testament principle of tithing that is the big deal in the New Testament. By the way, as an aside, we should remember that the tithe in the Old Testament was 10% the first year. 20% the second year, 30% the third year, and then the cycle started over again for the next three years. And then in the seventh year, the land had to lie fallow, so you got nothing out of your crops. A lot of Jews didn't like that, so they you know, would plow a little bit and try to get a little bit in the seventh year too. God said the land's got to rest every seven years. Now that comes out an average of 20% per year over a six-year period, and year number seven, you got no income coming in, which, by the way, also teaches some wise saving practices for times when there's nothing coming in. And most people don't save a nickel. They spend it all. Well, back to the message here. Now, that was an Old Testament saving plan. It was an enforced, carefully enforced Old Testament saving plan. So whatever they gave in year seven was above that 20%. And, you know, I don't know a whole lot of Christians who like the Old Testament law who want to tithe that much. There are a lot of Christians who like the Old Testament law because they think it only requires them to give 10% and the rest they can spend on themselves. In the New Testament, the emphasis is not on the tithe required by the law. Remember, you're not under law, but under grace. You say, wow, I'm not under law. That means I don't have to give any. I'm not under even 10%. Maybe I'll give 2% if I feel like it. I'm not under law, I'm under grace. In the New Testament, what do you see? You see giving freely out of a heart that is filled with love for God and the brethren. That's the basis of giving in the New Testament. The basis is love, not law. And do you know something? Love 
always does more than the law requires. Don't forget that. Genuine love, genuine love, not just mouth love, genuine love always does more than the law requires. You will sacrifice for the people you love. Do you love God? Remember we're talking about sacrificial giving. That's the New Testament standard. Not 10% of the law, even if you want to hold the 10% thing, although it was really a 20% average, 10%, 20%, 30%, then do it over again, and then the last year you don't get to plow anything out of your field. And then you start another seven-year cycle until you get to the year of Jubilee, which is the 50th year. After year 49, you have the year of Jubilee, where there was a complete release of everything, all debts, you know. Quite a different system than the people who want to hold to the tithe today. It's sacrificial giving that we see in the New Testament. It's based on grace and love. A heart filled with love for God and love for the brethren. Grace. Sacrificial giving is based on love, not on law. So principle number one for how God provides for his children in need is sacrificial giving by people who understand grace. People who understand love. People who don't just talk about grace and love, but people who live grace and love. With that, let's look at the passage. 2 Corinthians, if you have your Bibles, turn over there. Now I want you to look at how often grace and love and suffering are mentioned together in this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. I'll wait for you to turn there. Everybody turn there. 2 Corinthians 8. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, that is, we remind you, of what? The grace of God. Paul starts off by talking about the grace of God and it's going to be exercised between churches. People are going to reflect the grace of God by the way in which they give. We do the wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a, what are the next four words? Great trial of affliction. We've got suffering here. We're starting with grace. We move into the issue of suffering. This is going to be sacrificial. The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. Was the widow who gave her two mites rich or poor? She was very poor, wasn't she? We are talking about some folks in Macedonia who didn't have diddly squat. And they were suffering, but they were filled with joy in their hearts because they really knew Christ. They really knew and understood what he had done for them. And they were ready to give everything. Are we like the churches of Macedonia where we have great trial of affliction? Where we have deep poverty. It doesn't just say they were pretty poor. They had deep poverty. But look at the next phrase. Because they had that joy, it abounded unto the riches of of their liberality. And he's not talking about the American media when he says liberality. <laughs> he's talking about generosity. They not only opened their hearts, they opened their wallets. Verse 3, For to their power I bear record. Paul says, I'm going to bear witness about these folks. Yea, and beyond their power, they were willing to go beyond what they could if they'd had more, they would have given more. They wouldn't have cut it off at that point. Beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. I did not have to bend their arms. 
I did not have to browbeat them. I did not have to say, if you don't give more, God is going to judge you, you wicked hypocrites. They say, ooh, Paul, and Paul does a miracle, and they say, whoa, baby, we better watch out. Well, where, where's my purse? You know, they'll throw in a couple more bucks, you know. Maybe I can avoid this. He never had to browbeat them. Some preachers browbeat all the time on this subject. They were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. Paul, please take some more. We know the churches at Jerusalem having a rough time. They begged Paul to take their money to meet the needs of suffering believers. Even though they themselves were suffering, they were going through a great trial of affliction. They were deeply poor. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us, ah, listen to this, the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Did you know that giving builds fellowship? It does. I can look back at times in my life when I didn't have two nickels to rub together, not even two pennies to rub together, you know. And out of the blue, God had moved somebody to send us a gift, especially when we were young married couple I was making 50 bucks a week and I didn't have a housing allowance and I didn't have a parsonage provided I had to live on 50 bucks a week newly married with a baby on the way and I know that was a long time ago that was before Noah came over on the ark and you wonder how did I manage to survive the flood and all that kind of stuff but uh, <laughs> and every now and then just out of the blue somebody would send us a gift you know what? That built a, an incredible bond of love and fellowship because they had been sensitive to what God told them to do. And in some cases, it was quite sacrificial. When I went from San Antonio to my first church in New Jersey, you know, there are other churches here in New Jersey. <laughs> some of them are pretty good. Um, but up in North Jersey, um, my second year, the church couldn't pay me anything. I had to go to work in a factory at $1.60 an hour. And it was heavy manual labor. And God met our needs. At that time, a friend in Texas whom I hadn't seen in years, said God had laid it on his heart to send money every month to help support me at the church. It was a sacrifice, but he was happy to do it. And he did that for four or five years. The Bible is true when it says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God met the needs of that man too. I'll tell you something. He became a millionaire. God saw that he could trust that individual with the resources that he'd put in his care. I never asked him for it. I didn't preach this junk like the apostates we've been talking about. God moved him. And he met our needs. It was a sacrificial giving. Sacrificial giving from believers to other believers. The fellowship of the ministering of the saints, verse 4. Verse 5. And this they did, not as we hoped. He's been talking about the churches of Macedonia because he's telling the Corinthians they need to get on the stick and do what they promised. But how do, how do you get to this point? He explains how you get to this point in verse 5. But first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. In other words, they understood that they were stewards and not owners. You know, if you give yourself to somebody, it means that everything you own belongs to them. They understood that when they'd given themselves to God. They just wanted to use the resources that he entrusted to them the way that he wanted the resources used. 
Verse 6, insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would finish in you. What's this word again? Next four words. Read them for me. Verse 6, last four words. Huh, we're back to grace again. Do we see anything about Old Testament law of the tithe in here? What we're looking at is grace, understanding and applying the principles of grace. <laughs> Look at verse 7. We find it again. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge, notice the Corinthian church, they, they had lots and lots of spiritual gifts. You find that out in 1 Corinthians. So they, they were abounding in faith. They were abounding in utterance. They liked to talk about it. They were abounding in knowledge. Man, there was all kinds of good stuff that they knew from the word of God. And in diligence, they were not sluggards. And in your love to us, says Paul, see that you abound in this word, grace. Also, giving is an act of grace. Undeserved, unmerited, but moved by a heart of love for God and other believers. Look at verse 8. What does it prove? I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove, what are the next five words? What does sacrificial giving prove? The sincerity of love. You can talk about love all day long, but what proves it? I love the brethren. Oh, man, I love the brethren. I go to church every week and I tolerate them for a full hour on Sunday morning. Man, I'm glad I don't have to live with them the rest of the week. Is that the love of the brethren? What does Paul say is where the rubber meets the road in terms of the sincerity of love is in giving. He's talking about sacrificial giving. He's talking about people who had a great trial of affliction. People who had deep poverty. He says, I'm not commanding you to do that. That would be law. But by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Now, what do we find again in verse 9? The same words showing up again. For you know, what are the next six, seven words? The grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about grace oh, giving in the New Testament, sacrificial giving. We're talking about grace. It's a proof of love. It's a proof that we understand the concept of grace. But I earned it. It's mine. No, you wouldn't have earned it if God didn't give you the strength, if God didn't give you the job, if God didn't give you the opportunity, if God didn't put you at this particular point in history, if God didn't give you the health to do it. It's all of grace. You're merely a steward. Remember, that's where we started of the things that God has entrusted to your care. And the example is Christ himself. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich. Can you think of anybody richer than Jesus? The one who made everything, who made all the silver, who made all the gold, who made all the diamonds and rubies and emeralds and stuff. Anybody richer than the guy who can make everything? Sort of like people who want to be like King Midas. Everything he touched turned to gold. Kind of tough if you want to eat lunch. You can't pick it up. It turns to gold. <laughs> Listen to the next part. Yet for your sakes. What's the verse that tells us what motivated him for our sakes, John 3, 16, hint, for God so what? Love. You're back to love and grace. And you're tied to sacrificial giving. For your sakes, he became poor. He left the riches of heaven and through the virgin birth became a Jew 2,000 years ago where they didn't even have air conditioning, which we consider an essential. And he lived for 33 years and was crucified on a Roman cross. 
while people stared at his nakedness and laughed at him. The God who owned everything. People, that's grace. That's love. That's the illustration that Paul uses to talk about sacrificial giving where believers meet the needs of other believers. That's the illustration and the principal example of giving. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Do you get the point? Sacrificial giving makes others rich even though it might make us poor. We don't like that concept. Why should I give him more than I got? You know what? Parents often do that for their children because they love their children. They want their children to have the best. Folks, I can tell you that I would certainly be a lot richer if I had not paid for college, medical school, and graduate school for my 13 children. I would be a whole lot richer if I just had hoarded it all. You know, I could have just let them, like a lot of college kids do, I just let them borrow money and pay their own way through school and saved all of my money for myself. You know, I worked as a lawyer for more than 20 years. The combined years of education that my kids have been in school is more than 100 years of tuition, room, board, books, transportation, clothing, and miscellaneous costs. More than 100 years when you add up all the years that they spent in school. But if I had only been focused on hoarding money for myself, what would be the purpose? Verse 10, 1 Corinthians 8. Paul's going to give him some advice. Here and I give my advice. He's been talking about money. He's been talking about Christ as our example. So I'm going to give you my advice, says Paul, for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. A year ago, you promised you were going to do this. A year ago, you talked about, wow, you know, those poor believers there in Jerusalem, they're having a rough time. Yeah, they're having a rough time. Isn't it sad that the poor believers in Jerusalem are having a rough time? Yeah, somebody ought to give them money. You know, we ought to take up a collection for them. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Why don't we take up a collection for the believer? They had already talked about this a year ahead of time. They like to talk about it and feel sorry about it. Like we talk about and feel sorry for our missionaries. And we're way behind the missions budget. I'm going to give you advice, says Paul. You guys who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now, verse 11, therefore, perform the doing of it don't just talk about it that as there was a readiness to will man you guys were gung-ho for this so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have you keep saying well you know someday we'll have enough money to give we don't have it right now but we're, someday we'll have enough money to give paul says be a performance out of what you have in other words quit dragging your feet verse 12 for if there be first a willing mind, you've got to buy into the principles first. If you don't have a willing mind, it'll never happen. So Paul gives this entire passage here. He says, you guys did at one point have a willing mind. Now stop talking about it and do it. Do you have a willing mind? Remember we talked about thorns in the flesh where we have a weakness of character. And so God gives us a thorn in the flesh that probably relates specifically to that area of weakness in character. Remember that in this context. Now therefore perform the doing of it that as there was a readiness of will, a to will, so there may be a performance out of that which ye have. For if there first be a willing mind, now listen to the next phrase, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Remember the widow's might. Paul is talking about precisely the same principle here 
that Jesus was talking about while he was watching people throw money into the collection box. According to what you have, not according to what you don't have. And remember, she had no husband to replace it. Everything she gave up, that was it. Verse 13, For I mean not that other men be eased and ye be burdened. That's not my point. I'm not just trying to put a crowbar on you all so that somebody else can have it easy while you suffer. But verse 14, But by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that is their need, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that is, for your need, that there may be an equality. In other words, this is building the bond of fellowship that he talked about in the first part of the passage. You know, that's the old principle of what goes around comes around. It's also what's known in Scripture as the law of harvest. What you sow is what you reap. The amount that you sow determines the amount that you reap. Paul reminds them of this here in this passage. He reminds them of this by referring to manna that God provided for 40 years during the Old Testament wilderness wanderings. The only day that you were allowed to save it overnight was on Friday night so that you wouldn't have to go out and look for it on Saturday morning. And you remember what the people did? Some of them didn't bother. They figured it'll be here tomorrow morning. You know, it's standard. It's, you know, it's, it's just the way things work. And they went out Saturday morning. It wasn't there. Other people thought, man, I'm not sure if it's going to be here tomorrow. And it was Monday, you know. So on Monday, they got twice as much or three times as much. And they kept it overnight just in case it wasn't there in the morning. And it got worms. People, we need to learn to do what God tells us to do. Do it God's way, and you get God's blessing. God had to teach them some lessons. You know what? God can teach us lessons, too. We are very wealthy compared to all the rest of the world. Sometimes, as the report in the bulletin shows each week, it looks like some people are not given anything. Or very, very little. Less than they'd pay for going to a movie. Less than they'd pay for going out to eat. And some of you go out to eat a lot during the week. Here's where he talks about the manna, verse 15. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over. He that gathered little had no lack. It's a balance. Paul says that there was an equality among them. But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. Titus also loved and prayed for the Corinthians. For indeed he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. Paul, please send me back to the Corinthians. I love those folks. I'll carry your message back to them. I'll remind them what they promised to do a year ago. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not only that, but who was chosen of the churches to travel with us. What's the next four, three words? With this grace. You see, the offering that was going to be taken up related to grace, not law. And so they sent some honest brother with Titus, whom everybody trusted, so nobody would say that they had embezzled money like Judas, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and the declaration of your ready mind. Now, in the morning service, we've been talking about doing all to the glory of God. Did you catch that phrase? Which is ministered to us, or by us, to the, to the glory of the same Lord. When you give this way, this is one of the ways in which you do all to the glory of God. Sacrificial giving not only provides for the needs of Christians who have nothing, but it's one of the great ways in which God is glorified. You see, when he is our God and not money being our God, he is glorified when he is God and not the money that he's entrusted to us. And when God is God, we learn to treat money this way. Verse 20, avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us. 
providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. That's why there were two people who were sent along. That's why we have a group of ladies who count the offerings so that nobody can ever accuse somebody of embezzling some of it. Verse 22, And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent, upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of. They are the messengers of the churches. The churches chose them. They didn't just appoint themselves. And the glory of Christ. Are we back to the glory of God again? Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches. Read me the next five words. The proof of your love. What's he been talking about? That big, long, 11-letter word? Sacrificial giving. That's the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf can't believe we're already at 20 after (laughs) i want to get through both principles tonight i didn't get to the second one yet i got one more passage we'll read in relation to that first principle about meeting the needs of other believers philippians chapter 1 verses 19 chapter 2 verse 30 and chapter 4 verse 19 philippians chapter 1 verse 19 for i know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of jesus christ And then he talks about Epaphroditus in verse 30 of chapter 2, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. He was willing to die because of his love as he served Paul. He gave up a job. He gave up, you know, living at home. He went to help the apostle Paul to minister to his needs. And then verse 19 the same thing that Paul talked about in the law of harvest back there in that passage in 2 Corinthians but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus well I would like to have said a lot about that but that at least gets us through principle number one that we want to talk about the two normal ways that God meets the needs of believers our gracious Heavenly Father we thank you once again for your word and for its power and for the things that we've studied tonight. We pray that you'll help us to take them to heart. We don't like the concept of sacrificial giving because it goes against the flesh. And we know that if that happens to be a character weakness, that you are able to give us a thorn in the flesh. Thorns in the flesh. Things that affect our physical bodies things that are way too painful for us to endure but are reminders to us not to continue sinning in a particular area or keeping us from sin that would be even worse in those areas. Father, once again, we thank you for the privilege of having studied your word tonight. We pray that you will guide and direct and bless us as we make application of this text tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.